Well, I'm excited this morning. I got nervous a few times during our worship that my sermon was going to be preached. (laughs) Between the words and the encouragement that we're given. So I know that God is already speaking. I believe that he has a message that he wants us to hear and what we need to know this morning. We're continuing in a series of messages as I've already been sharing about the DNA of a Christ follower. This is a book that that I had read by Darren Wright and, and it was an amazing book that was given to me, and I believe that as we've gone through each of these weeks, that first and foremost, a Christ follower is very much different than just a generic Christian. Many people call themselves or identify themselves as Christian, but when you say you're a Christ follower, that becomes very narrow, and people have a different understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower. And we've already looked at several aspects of what this looks like. Number one, if you recall, we looked at being a lover of God. First and foremost, you have to love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all your strength. If you're going to be a Christ follower, you have to love God. Amen? Now, if that is true, then the second thing that the Bible says, if we say that we love God, we have to love one another. The second characteristic is loving one another. And third, we talked about this last week, being truth-based or being Bible-based in what we believe. In other words, the Bible is our authority for faith and conduct. We don't go to any other source but the Word of God first. This is the truth that is above all other truths. And so this morning, we're going to look, as you take your word this morning, why don't you stand as we open to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Now think about this as you're opening your Bible to 1 Peter. Remember who Peter was. Remember some of the history of Peter as a disciple and a follower of Jesus. Peter gets some bad press because Peter was the one who denied our Lord. Not once, but three times. How many of you remember that Peter was that that bold kind of disciple, many times getting his foot inserted in his mouth because he would speak before he thought, or he was very bold. And so Peter is this type of of disciple, but there's something that happens to Peter when we get to the book of Acts. And when Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit, the same man that couldn't talk to a 13-year-old girl now has the power of God going through his life, and he stands up and he preaches a powerful message. So think about Peter was transformed and changed by the resurrection of Jesus because the infilling of the Holy Spirit that filled his life. Why don't we look at 1 Peter and uh, chapter 1 and beginning at verse 3. I believe that God is a God of hope. Do you believe that? It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Can you thank God for that? This living hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Verse 6 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, it will be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus, whom, having not seen, you love. Though you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. There was a lot of joy in our praise this morning. Amen? I thank God that there's joy in the house of the Lord. Verse 9 says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Skipping down to verse 13, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. What is he saying? He's giving us a word picture. In those days, they wore tunics. And so someone who was going to gird themselves meant that they would pick up their long robe and tuck it in. They were getting ready for action. What is the word saying? Gird up 
the loins of your mind, get sober and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus as obedient children, not conforming ourselves to the former lusts as in our ignorance. But notice what it says in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. The fourth characteristic of a Christ follower is that they are holy. Holy unto the Lord and holy saved by His grace. Can you thank Him for that? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for the grace that You've given to us by the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit that gives life open our spiritual eyes and our ears to hear what You would say to us this morning. God, I pray that you would reveal from the depths of our heart our true character, our true nature, and our true identity. Father, may you give us hope today that through the gospel, the living and breathing word of God that gives power and life, that it would transform us, that this word would change us, that this word would inspire us and give us hope like no other hope. We thank you, Jesus, that you're not dead, but you are alive. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have come to give us life and to give us an abundant life and an overcoming life. We give thanks to you, Lord, for doing this and so much more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. To be quick on this, the word holy, it means many different things. But at its core meaning, the word holy means to be different. A Christ follower is holy. This means different in a good way. How many of you believe that? Yes, yes. How many of you know that, the, that you can uh, say that some followers of Christ might be different, but that might not be good? Some of you know what I'm talking about. But by the very nature of God, he is expressing to us through 1 Peter that the very nature or essence of the Lord is that he is a God who is holy. He is entirely separate from his creation. Our God is an awesome God. There is none like the Lord. He is perfect in his holiness. God is morally pure. There is no evil in God whatsoever. There is no wrong to be found in him. Only God himself is perfectly good and separate from sin. God is a God who is holy. And He's not just holy, God is perfectly holy. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, Nobody is holy like the Lord. Since God is holy, everything associated with Him is also holy. Heaven is a realm that is holy. God's throne is holy. God's power is holy. God's presence with us today is holy. This word is holy. This word of the Lord is holy. Can I just go and, and summarize it like this? All the ways of God are, you got it, they are holy. Therefore, all who would want to be near him must also be holy. His angels, God's friends, and his chosen people. Another meaning for holy is this. And this is the word that we often refer to. You hear Paul talk about this in the book of Romans, is sanctified, which means the word to be set apart. That did you not know that you were sanctified in Christ? You were set apart. That's what it means to be holy. And it's very uh, basic meaning. To be morally different means to have a standard of beliefs and behaviors of knowing what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. To do This is the holiness that the Bible speaks about. Holiness involves our separation from anything in our lives that can be sinful or anything in our lives that is impure or anything in our lives dealing with our commitment to God. To be holy means to serve God. To be holy means to belong to Him. And if you belong to Him, 
Friends, we have the privilege of bringing honor to him. That's our privilege. Therefore, as a Christ follower, we need to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. I like how Warren Wearsby says this about a holy person. He says a holy person doesn't have to be an odd person. How many of you know there's enough of odd Christians around? We don't need any more. It doesn't mean to be an odd person, but a different kind of person. The quality of their present life isn't only different from their past way of life, it is different in their lifestyle of those who live around them. To be holy means that you're different. You know, as a young person growing up in the church, I struggled with this in my younger years. Because how many of you know as a young person, you want to fit in with everybody. You don't want to be different than anybody. But my friends, I have to tell you, to be a Christ follower, it means that you have to be set apart. You're going to be different than others. Maybe not outwardly in the way that you look, but the way that you live. A Christian's lifestyle is one of holiness, and it may seem strange to non-believers, but it isn't strange to other Christ followers. I like what Darren Wright says. He says, holiness isn't merely being different. It is a distinctiveness of our moral character and our action. What are the reasons for holiness in a Christian's life? What is this set-apartness? You see, this set-apartness either attracts people or it repels them. Jesus was holy, and he drew people to him. Holiness is not about keeping a list of do's and don'ts. Holiness is about serving the Lord and bringing him honor. And why should we live a holy life? I want to give you three reasons that we're going to just look at quickly before I jump back into our text. Number one, why we want to live a holy life, first and foremost, should be to please God. Do you, have a, do you want to please God? If you want to please God, you have to live a holy life. To, to please God means to show gratitude. And all of us are called, by the word of God says, we are called to live a holy life. He, is, he has loved us and gave himself for us. And so living a holy life is one that honors God. And this honor is in response to all that he is and all that he does for us. So to live a holy life is to please God. But how many of you know this? Number two, holy lives change lives. What do I mean by that? Holy lives change lives. Holy lives can reach other people. It's interesting in in some of the, the more recent data of some of these church statisticians that look at churches and look at trends, especially here in America, one of the most revealing things that I read and discovered was this. Listen, my friends. The closer a church becomes aligned to its culture, meaning that the church, the way that it lives, the way that it looks, the way that it acts, the more aligned that the church becomes to the culture, the sooner that church will decline and ultimately die. So what is this saying? We've got to be called holy. We've got to be called separate. We have to look different than those in the world around us. You see, because the Bible calls us to be salt and light. And if we cease to be salt and light, we are no different than the culture that is around us. How many believe that a changed life changes lives? I believe that because we can say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord did. He saved us. He sanctified us. And he made us holy. He changed our lives from the inside out. And holy churches, I believe, are churches that will change their community. I believe that holy people are people that are called to live not an ordinary life. But I believe that God has called us to live an extraordinary life. A life that is to look like him. And this is one that is greater than our culture. Thirdly, I believe that through holiness, we get, we get from God our spiritual power. They go hand in hand. A holy people receives the holy power of God. This is why when we are saved, the Holy Spirit lives no longer in temples made with hands. But where does the Spirit live? He lives in our hearts. And the Spirit that lives in us is the same Spirit that had power to raise Christ from the dead. 
Therefore, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit that gives us the spiritual power to live a holy life. Being filled with and led by the Holy Spirit is what it means to live a holy life. And I'm thankful that we are a Pentecostal church that still believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Without that power, we cannot live a life that honors God or pleases Him. You know, I can't but help but quickly think about in the Old Testament the story in the life of one of the judges by the name of Samson. You remember that story? But if you read that story back in Judges 13, it was from his mother's womb that God called him. And God didn't just place a calling on his life, he called him to be a Nazarite. He called him to live a holy life. Nazarites were a separate group of people. Jesus was a Nazarite. This holy calling on Samson's life was to live different than the culture around him. And how many of you know that the secret of Samson's strength was in this calling on his life? From his birth, the angel told his mother that he was to not cut his hair. And through this, God from his, his youth, he had incredible supernatural power. I believe that Samson didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't think he looked like a... A, a, a tremendous bodybuilder. I don't believe that he looked like anything other than an ordinary guy. But when Samson was anointed with the Holy Spirit, he slew a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Why? Because the Spirit of the, God, of the living God came upon him and power flowed through his life. And, and we understand that through this story, it ends rather tragically for Samson, doesn't it? There are some lessons to be learned of the terrible consequences when we as God's children forsake our separateness. We read in the story of, of Samson in his life that for all of the enemies that could not defeat him, the thousands of the Philistines and those pagan armies, we read how Samson fell to the hands of a woman as weak as any other man. Why? Because he stepped out of his holiness. He stepped out of that separateness. And I was reminded of this hymn by A.B. Simpson, who's a great writer, and he wrote this hymn called, I Want to Be Holy. And this is what he writes, I'm weary of sinning and stumbling. Sound familiar? Repenting and falling again. I'm tired of resolving and striving and finding the struggle so vain. I long for an arm to uphold me, a will that is stronger than mine, a Savior to cleanse me and fill me and keep me with power divine. How many of you can, can relate to this? This is sometimes the very struggle in our lives in, in growing up in the church. And I, I can't help but think about drawing upon my own understanding having grown up in this very church some of you can relate to what I understand now as as having grown up but I've discovered that in the church while growing up there there is this thing I will call the holiness gap you ever hear of the holiness gap good I'm about to tell you I've observed by my experience growing up in this very church that there is oftentimes a gap between our understanding of what it means to be holy and how to be holy. Am I the only one that ever observed that? There's a great gulf that sometimes exists between our understanding of what the Word of God says that I am called to be holy. In the eyes of my Father God, He looks at me and He doesn't see Greg. He sees the holiness of Jesus in me. And that position of my holiness is not something that I can earn. It's not something I deserve. It's not something I, I, I have to, to work for in order to achieve it or to receive it. It's given to me at the very beginning of, of, of my salvation experience. But then for some time later, there's this gulf or this gap, this separation that just naturally takes place over time where we struggle in trying to live a holy life. 
Why is that? As a child, it wasn't at all difficult for me quickly to understand and even accept Jesus and to understand my own need personally in my life to invite Jesus to come into my life to be my Savior. As a child, I readily understood that, and many of you understand that as well. But you know what? The goal of receiving Jesus so many times in Sunday school, I was told that the goal was so that I could go to heaven. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you heard that same goal? Come and receive Jesus so that he can forgive you of your sins so that one day you might be good enough to go to heaven. My friends, that's not the goal at all. Heaven is the byproduct. The goal is that we would become like him. The goal of a Christ follower is not to gain heaven, my friends. The goal of a Christ follower is to be transformed and to become like Christ. To be like Jesus. And you know what? This gap exists in many people's hearts, in many Christians' lives, and many young people growing up in the church today are still struggling. And many of you seated here are understanding that this gap still exists. The ultimate goal of our life is to be a Christ follower and to be like Christ, to be more like Him. So in order to understand this, I want to quickly just unpack two aspects of our holiness. I just want to look at two aspects because this is such a broad topic. There are two aspects of our holiness that we need to gain a foundational understanding in. Number one, the first aspect of our holiness is that every one of us needs to understand the position of our holiness. Where does it come from? It's amazing. The moment that our spiritual eyes were opened, we understood our need and declared our faith in Christ's eternal sacrifice for our sins. When we did that at that instant, with very little outward visible difference, God declared us to be holy, didn't he not? When God declared this, he said, you are set apart for me. And sin was removed, and the perfection of Jesus, his righteousness was applied to us. Friends, you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It was purely a gift of God in response to our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. This is why we can go to the New Testament and look at a couple examples in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, it says, those who are sanctified in Christ, God set us apart for himself. And so I want to quickly look at two introduction letters to uh, the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians 1, 1, if you want to turn there with me, you can. To understand the position of our holiness, if you are a Bible, if you're a Bible student and a scholar, you spend time studying the Word of God, you learn that, that each of the letters that Paul had written had a specific audience in mind. There were actual people that, that Paul had, had gone out on his missionary journeys and had planted these churches. He personally knew the people that he was writing to. He didn't just write a letter for the sake of writing a letter. He understood his audience. So what we understand about the church at Ephesus, that Paul is writing to a good group of people. These are good Christian people. These are good Christ followers. Notice what Paul says in verse 1 of Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. How many of you ever noticed that the Bible doesn't refer to Christians as sinners anymore, but the Bible refers to us as saints? This is what Paul is referring to here. Paul is saying... To, to the, those who are by the will of God, to the saints that are in Ephesus. Now, as we understand that the audience that he was writing to, these are mostly good people. And therefore, it's easy to understand that he would call them saints or holy ones. It's kind of easy to relate to a good bunch as saints, isn't it? Well, then if we go over to another letter in the, in the church of Corinth, why don't we flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Now as you're flipping over there, there's a different circumstance going on in this church than the church in Ephesus. 
if you would take the time to read the book of Corinth, you would understand that this church was a church full of a bunch of rowdies, a bunch of rebels. Maybe somebody here can identify. Maybe you're here as a rebel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now as you are finding your, your way over there, these people in Corinth had a bit of a sordid history. They regularly fought with one another. They would bicker. Sometimes they would backbite. They would speak evil against one another. In fact, in the church, there was even those who were sexually immoral. Immature babes, as Paul would note some of them. Some of them even got drunk. Now, keeping this in mind, look at his introduction to this letter. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, which means set apart, in Christ Jesus, called to be what? Saints, uh-oh, Paul, you made a mistake here. Who call on the name of Jesus, our Lord, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is this a biblical example of fake news? Uh-oh, did I say that? I'm sorry, wrong story. Is this a mistake that the Apostle Paul made? Is this a misprint in our Bible? How could he look at two churches and say the same thing? What he must be referring to is not how they were behaving, but who they were believing in. You see, for every saint is called to be holy. Every one of us is made holy through the sacrifice of Jesus. This is our position. This is our true identity of what it means to be a Christ follower. Our position is one to be holy to the Lord. As he referred to them as saints, because this is an example of their positional holiness, the way that God the Father sees all of us, all of us here today by the, by the will of God can be called saints. Amen? Praise God. There's hope. Why don't you tap your neighbor and tell him there's hope? You see, God doesn't look at us any differently. When he sees Jesus in us, he sees the fact that we are called saints. Not because of who they are, but because of who he is. God had chosen them to be holy. God had done the work to declare them set apart and sanctified in Christ. Solely on, not their decision, but on the sacrifice of God's Son coming and dying for the sins of the world on the cross. It is because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we can be sanctified. And more than that, we can now be filled with with God's Spirit within us, His Holy Spirit. This is what it meant when they identified as saints in Christ, their true spiritual identity and position. Friends, you are the saints. When the saints go marching in on Sunday morning, come on, when we come in here, we need to hold our heads up. You need to sometimes remember old Slewfoot, the enemy when he comes talking on your shoulder and reminding of you all the wrong that you've done, remind him, I know in whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that my God is able. This is the fact or the foundation that will keep you from being a yo-yo Christian. Up one Sunday and down the next. You leave on Sunday morning and you fall on Sunday morning. On Monday morning, rather. And you go all week long waiting for Sunday to come again. And then you're back up again. It's because we don't understand the foundation of our true identity and what Christ has won for us and what he has achieved for us. This is the foundation upon all foundations that must be built into our lives and built into our understanding. Listen to this. If you've repented of your sins and you've put faith in Jesus, the Bible says you are declared holy by God, apart from how holy your behavior or your thinking is at this very moment. You belong to God. A transaction took place. Know ye not that you are the redeemed of the Lord, those he purchased with his own blood. 
This is what it means to be redeemed of the Lord. You belong to him. Ownership has transferred from your account to God's account. Every Christian, every Christ follower is declared holy based on faith. When we access the benefits and sacrifice of Jesus, nothing of our personal perfection, but rather Christ's perfection that is applied to us. God says, I bought you, I redeemed you, I keep you. God says, I love you. This needs to be repeated again and again in our minds, in our hearts. No matter how, how we have fallen, no matter how many times we, we have, have missed the mark, remember this, I've been bought with a price. I no longer belong to me, but I belong to him. Know this, that God has chosen us, God calls us holy, God calls us his. The impossibility, however, to function in holiness, or the second word, is the practice of our holiness. You see, we have to understand the position of our holiness before we can ever practice holiness. When we don't fully comprehend our position in holiness, it becomes very difficult to practice holiness. Until, friends, you know that you're secure in Christ. You know, I, I went to school in my high school years in a Baptist school, and oftentimes we would debate because of the theology difference when it comes to eternal security. But my friends, there's something to know our security in Christ and what he achieved for us is far greater than anything we could ever achieve on our own. And to be eternally insecure is to not put one's faith and trust in the finished, accomplished work of the cross. There's an impossibility for us to function in holiness or to practice holiness until we understand the result of our holiness is because of God's gift of Jesus. We are holy because he is holy. Did you catch that? You are holy because God is holy. You are holy. You are called saints, set apart ones, because of Jesus. Not because you can earn it, not because you deserve it, but because he did it for you on Calvary. This is what brings the joy into our life, into our existence, is that when we understand the position of our holiness, it becomes much more attainable to live in the practice of our holiness. Number two, God calls us to practice holiness, to live a different life than those around us. Do we, are we good at this point? So quickly this morning, I want to talk about how do we close the gap. God wants to close the gap between our position and our practice. You see, there's a gap sometimes in people's minds between who they were and who God has called them to become. You see, there has to be a transition. There, there's a battle that often rages on the inside of us, and the battle goes something like this. I want to be in control. I want to call my shots. I want to live my life. My friends, if you have accepted Jesus, the transaction has to be not just from accepting Jesus as your Savior, but here's the underlying issue for all of us. Have you made Jesus your Lord? You see, everybody wants fire insurance because the alternative of not going to heaven is going certainly to hell. You see, you didn't buy fire insurance when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You made a transaction to transfer the ownership of your life from you to God. You see, we as Christians are struggling because we forgot that this transaction took place 2,000 years ago. It took place the day that you knelt and you prayed and you invited Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior. Did you not know at that moment you came under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. So no, as Paul would say later on in his letters, we are no longer the slaves of sin, but we've become a slave to Jesus. You see, that's not talked about very much because it's not popular. Paul said, I became a slave to, to, to 
the will of God so that he might become all things to all people that he might win some. The issue of our holiness is not about trying to find a prescribed checklist in your life. I did this, I did that, I'm good here, I'm good there. The question of our holiness is who's in charge? Is Christ the Lord of your life? Have you surrendered your will completely and totally and fully to his will? Dying to your old way that you once lived before the cross to now be raised to life by the power of the Spirit to walk a new way, to walk a new life, to go in a new direction, forsaking what was behind but looking forward to what is ahead. This is what it means, my friends, to be a Christ follower. To me, it started with water baptism. It is there that I identify myself in my life with Christ's death, with Christ's burial, and with Christ's resurrection, that when Christ died, I died with him. But I didn't stay dead, neither did Christ. Because by the same power that raised him from the dead, I too was raised to life in the Spirit and by the Holy Spirit. This is important for us to grasp and to understand until we fully surrender and seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Wherever he is not fully in charge, you aren't going to make much progress. This is why some Christians struggle. This is why some are like yo-yos. They're up one week and down the next. I'm up and I'm down. I'm up and I'm down. Trying to live for God when God has been looking for us to surrender, without our surrender, our lives are futile. Would you turn with me to Paul's letter in Romans chapter 12? We need to close the gap, amen? Are you ready to close the gap? Ask your neighbor, are you ready to close the gap? Well, there's a lot of talking going on. There must be some back talk. You see, there's none of us, none of us exempted here. Paul lays down in the book of Romans for 11 chapters this beautiful discourse on the doctrine. To know the book of Romans is, is what every Christian's privilege. If there's a book of the Bible that you should become familiar with, read Romans. It's a great chapter. Paul gives his own expression in, in, in Romans chapter 7 where he says, uh, or he's talking about who's going to save me from this wretched body of the flesh? Who's going to rescue me? Then he comes to this revelation by the Spirit in Romans 8 verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to them who are what? In Christ Jesus. You see, a transaction took place. The ownership had, had, had been passed from your hands to God's hands. This is why Paul would say again in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present now your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may able, be able to prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is what it means to close the gap. We need to make our full surrender. And there's good news about this. The moment that you come to realize today that you need the Lord, the moment that you go back on Monday and you find yourself struggling again, remember this. The moment that you declare that you need him, he's ready to take the wheel. Brothers and sisters, 
If you want to go far with God, get out of the driver's seat and let God be in the driver's seat. Your struggle is real and your struggle is futile until you get out of the way. Until you take your hands off the wheel and let go and let God be the Lord of your life, you're going to continue to go around the mountain one more time. You're going to keep going around in that desert wandering, waiting for your deliverer when the deliverer is saying, are you tired? Are you done? Are you ready? You see, Jesus is the perfect gentleman. He won't barge his way in. He's waiting for you to step out of the way. Are you willing to dare to do what you haven't done before and get out of the way? Will you change seats? Will you let Jesus be the Lord of your life? Will you let him be the driver of your seat? Growing in our holiness is also a partnership. Our position, we've been made holy, but there's a partnership to walk in holiness to continue to walk in the position that God has placed us. You see, there's a partnership with God in our holiness. As long as we are willing to offer ourselves to Him, that's your part. His part will be to fill you and empower you. And this is the part I like the most. He will transform you to become like Him. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Remember Ephesians 5, 18, Do not be drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I love this passage of Scripture because when you go and you understand its original intent in, in the original language, it means not to be filled once. It means to continue to be filled to be repeatedly filled with the Holy Spirit, to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. My friends, when we are willing to allow His partnership and we're willing to do our part, we can close the gap. Galatians 5.16 says, Walking in the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Be warned and be ready to identify the temptations that lead us to live outside of our calling. There is a position that God has placed us in, and that is that he made us holy. There is a practice that the Apostle Paul will talk about, and he often refers it to the way that a believer walks. We're to walk in holiness. We're to walk in the truth. We are to walk in the light. But temptations are just that. They call us to live outside of our position and our practice. Beware of them. Break their power and break their cycle by not repeating them. By coming to God and asking Him for His help. I want to leave you with this final passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this is a verse of Scripture that brings a lot of comfort. Only the only spending time in God's Word and only spending time in His presence, does that develop the desire within us to be holy? Without, without His presence, we don't desire to be holy. But when we get into God's presence and we begin to worship, there's something about His presence that desires us to become close to Him. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23 says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. See, God's not looking for parts of your life. He wants the whole deal. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the hope, verse 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will also do it. See, some of us have been thinking that it's all on me. The pressure is on me. I've, I haven't performed at my best. I'm not good enough. I know some of you are still, maybe coming to this church for years, still struggling with secret sins. 
blaming on yourself. Did you hear what he said here in 1 Thessalonians? The God of peace himself will set you apart completely. Not just part of you, all of you, body, soul, mind, and spirit to be preserved. You see, we can't preserve ourselves. There's so much struggle, so much shame, so much pain that we endure because we haven't understood the gap between our position and our practice. Are you willing to take a bold step today and to say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life? Maybe you've acknowledged him as your savior and yes, you're forgiven of your sins. But the power flows through a yielded vessel, through a cleansed vessel. There are so many examples that we can look back in the Old Testament and see that God set apart a priesthood for service. God sets apart vessels in the temple for service. Anything of usefulness for God has to be sanctified as holy. The answer to our struggle is that he is faithful. And we say yes to Jesus. He will do what we ourselves cannot do. Praise God. That's good news, friends. That is hope for us. That is something worth living for. And that's worth telling somebody else about. It's God's desire and his call to us to be holy on the inside and on the outside. In our position, in our practice in every corner of our personality, in every facet of our being. Why? Because the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Can you say amen? amen. Would you stand with me this morning? God is calling us in truth. I said last week we as Christians have all the truth that we could possibly need more than we ever would possibly choose to probably obey we don't need more information what we need is a heart transformation that word tra transformation comes from a Greek word metamorphosis remember metamorphosis what you learned in school about the caterpillar. It spins itself a cocoon. It goes in a worm. But through the process of metamorphosis, a transformation, something glorious in a hidden place takes place with no eye can see. Something deep within your soul, something deep within your heart, a metamorphosis takes place where the old becomes transformed and comes out, not a worm, but a beautiful butterfly. This is a picture of what Christ does for us. The Christ, the hope of glory. If he can do that for Paul, if he can do that for Peter, friends, he can do that for you. And he can do that for your family. He can do that for your friends. He can do that for your neighbor. He can do that for anybody who would call upon his name. Are you ready? to make a change? Are you ready to make that transformation? Only God can transform a heart. Only God can transform our lives from hopeless to hopeful. Amen? Amen. He can do that right now. All it requires is you surrendering your heart and your life to Him. But more importantly, trans transferring ownership back to the Lord. Are you ready to give the ownership to Jesus of your life? Are you ready to give Jesus the ownership of your private thoughts? Are you ready to give Jesus the ownership of your body? Are you ready to give Jesus the ownership of your entire being? He wants not just parts of your life. He wants the whole package. Body, soul, mind, and spirit. He's redeemed you. He's bought you. He's called you by name. Don't stay on the sidelines any longer. But when the invitation is given, run to him. When the invitation comes, open your heart to him. Give your life to the Lord 
and you will not regret the transformation, the metamorphosis of being transformed not like yourself, but from yourself to become like him. Jesus, my prayer is that I would be more like you. With every head bowed and every eye shut. Lord, this is a holy moment. This is a moment, oh God, of our lives that we are confronted with the truth. Every one of us, God, positionally, have been made holy because of the work of Jesus on the cross, dying for our sins, and not only our sins, but for the sins of the world. Our position changed our lives from a life of sin, being obedient to sin and living for ourselves, a selfish life, a a self-centered life, to the reality that Christ, there is more. Christ, you are holy. Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. You recognize that your Father is holy, and therefore you are holy. And the Holy Spirit is holy. He's the one who sanctifies us and fills us with power and truth. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would transform lives today through this transaction of us coming to the realization that we must come to the end of ourselves and transform the ownership of our lives to the ownership of Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Jesus, be the Lord of our lives. Be the Lord of my life, of my thinking, of my thoughts. Be the Lord of my every day, of my every moment. Lord, be the Lord of my life. Be the Lord of my body. Be the Lord who reigns over all. Lord, help me to decrease through the power of the Holy Spirit that we might increase with more of your love, more of your power, more of your strength in our lives. In Jesus' name.